Well, good evening to you all. For those of you I've not yet had the chance to meet, my name is John Highbush and I'm the Executive Director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation. It <laughs> Uh, truly, my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. What I'd like to ask is, in honor of our men and women in uniform who defend our freedom around the world, would you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize some very special guests we have with us tonight. First, we are delighted to have Visa as the underwriter of this evening's forum. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but Visa is a California company created in California, and 3,750 of its 5,900 employees are our neighbors right here in California. And we are honored that Visa CEO Joe Saunders and his wife Sharon are, were able to join us for tonight's forum. Joe, our thanks go out to you and to Visa for your support of the foundation for its programming. Thank you, Joe. I would also like to introduce some very special guests we have this evening. 16 members of the 97th Congress of the United States those who were elected alongside President Reagan in 1980. They are here with us this evening for a reunion in celebration of President Reagan's centennial. Would all the members of the class of 1980 and their spouses please stand. Finally, I was just reminded before I came to the podium tonight that today is the 25th anniversary of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, a very um, tragic moment in the history of the Reagan presidency, and I thought it would be appropriate for us to just have a moment of silence for those uh, brave explorers. Thank you. Well, I learned long ago that when you invite someone to speak at the Reagan Library and a thousand seats are gone in a few hours of your announcement of the event, you probably have a speaker on your hands who needs very little introduction. Tonight is a true example of that as we welcome back Steve Forbes to the Reagan Library. So I will keep this introduction quite brief. I, I think that it's safe to divide our audience tonight into several groups. All of, whom Steve, uh, all of whom know Steve Forbes from one vantage point or another. Now, a number of you have likely followed Steve's extraordinary business career as the chairman of Forbes Media and the editor-in-chief of Forbes Magazine. I am sure there are a great many of you in the audience who have been reading Forbes Magazine for years. If you have, you've been reading the nation's leading business magazine that combined with Forbes Asia, and the company's licensee editions in China, Croatia, India, Israel, Indonesia, Korea, and across Central and Eastern Europe reach a worldwide audience of six million and growing. For those of you that follow the various Forbes media properties outside its well-known magazine, you already know that the change and turmoil that has overtaken the publishing industry did not catch Steve Forbes napping. In the last decade, Steve has personally overseen the development of a wide variety of new and interesting publications, including Forbes Life and Forbes Woman. His investments in Forbes.com and several related political, business, and sports websites have paid off handsomely. The web properties now reach nearly 40 million business decision makers each month. Then, I know there are many in this audience and I am sure Steve probably feels this number is not nearly large enough, who voted for Steve during one of his runs for the presidency in 1996 and 2000. Now, you are here because you admire Steve for his political and economic views, 
from his support of a flat tax to medical savings accounts. Steve, my bet is that these same people are here, at least in part, to urge you to make another run. Finally, there are some here, and I include myself among them, who have come to say thanks to Steve for all he has done for President Reagan and his vision of less taxes, less government, and more freedom for all Americans. Some of you may not know that Steve has served President Reagan directly over the years in several capacities. First, as his appointment to the role of Chairman of the Board of the International Broadcasting, where he oversaw the operation of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty behind the Iron Curtain during the Reagan years. And second, in a role that he serves in today as a member of the Board of the Reagan Foundation. Steve has been of enormous help as a trustee in making the Reagan Centennial Celebration a reality, and we cannot thank him enough for that. Which, come to think of it, means that I work for Steve. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm welcome to my boss, Steve Forbes. Thank you. Well, thank you very, very much, John, for those very kind words. Thank all of you for a very warm welcome in a fantastic setting. It is a great privilege to be here in the lead up to the formal celebration of Ronald Reagan's centennial on February 6th, and also to uh, be part of some of the uh, sessions today. And thank all of you for coming here this evening. Uh, some of you may have come here thinking you're going to get some good investment advice in these turbulent times. Uh, let me just warn you, in the name of full disclosure at the beginning, a favorite saying of my grandfather who founded our company back in 1917. He was an immigrant to this country, grade school education, very little money, but like millions who came to America, he had dreams and ambitions. And when he started Forbes magazine back in 1917, as you would expect, people would ask him what's going to happen to the economy, where are interest rates going, what stock should we buy, what stock should we sell. My grandfather being a, a very uh, uh, honest individual, invariably reply, he would say, you make more money selling the advice than following it. <laughs> so you're, 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 you're all, you're all that full disclosure out of the way. <clears throat> but they've been asked tonight to make a few observations about the opportunity that this new Congress has, particularly the House of Representatives, in moving ahead in the next two years and setting a foundation for 2012. We all know that this is an historic opportunity. For the, particularly for the House of Representatives. And you got a good feel for the need of it in that State of the Union address on Tuesday evening. The fundamental contrasts between Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama are still there, even though the White House is now trying to muddy the waters. Ronald Reagan was proud of his principles. He never used far-left liberal rhetoric to disguise what his true goals were. By contrast, the president used Reagan-esque rhetoric, but the big government agenda remains. And this has happened before, where liberals have tried to disguise what they're doing. I remember Ronald Reagan back in the 1980s when his policies helped win the Cold War. That suddenly, suddenly occurred to the Democrats, liberals in 1988 and 92, that they were perceived as weak on national security, which they were. And so suddenly at their convention, they had lots of American flags, lots of people in the military making all the right rhetoric. And Ronald Reagan at the Republican convention made note of this, as only he could. He recounted, suddenly all these flags appear, people in uniform, praise of the military. And as only Ronald Reagan could do, he shook his head and said, and they call me an actor. <laughs> well, well. The Academy Awards are coming up, and my nominee for Best Actor is President Obama after that State of the Union address. But unfortunately, while he will make concessions where he has to, the big government agenda remains, and that is the opportunity for this new Congress, because they're not powerless. Yes, you cannot govern from the House of Representatives. Legislatures cannot govern. But they can do a lot to set a positive agenda and get this country back on track. The President talks about spending restraints. You'd never know he'd been in office in the last two years. But also he couldn't resist in this address 
of saying we've got to spend some more in certain areas, like education. That's only doubled from the federal level in the last two years. Lord knows where the money went. He talked about the need for light rail. Well, that's all we all know is going to railroad the taxpayer. You know, these are mammoth money losers. They always go over budget two to three times. Every single one around the world loses money, except for maybe one or two when you actually look at the thing. And just look what it does. There's, for example, uh, Bill McCollum's from Florida. There's a proposal that the Florida voters had already turned down of a rail, light rail between Tampa and Orlando. Well, that sounds nice until you look at the cost, and then also who's going to use it? Because on all of these, unless you're in a high-density area, you got to get to the station. How do you get there? You're not going to ride a horse. You're going to go by car. Then when you get to the next station, what do you do? Stand there? No. You need a car, bus. Maybe the bus will show up. So what are these things for? Even Europe, where they put in money for decades, only 6% of passengers go by rail. And yet if the president goes through with these projects, hundreds of billions of dollars literally are going to be spent in the next uh, generation on something that is just a waste of capital outside of just a handful of areas. And so this, this help, you see it in health care. He's throwing over that 1099 provision where if you're a small business in two years, you're going to have to file a 1099 form, tax identification number, address for every transaction you do above 600, he knows that's going to go, so he'll, he'll, he'll throw that over. But the virtual takeover of health care, that's going to remain. Now, this isn't the old-time socialism where government takes over uh, companies. Uh, this is more a sophisticated version of big government. In this case, you don't take over companies, you just control them. You tell them what they can do and cannot do, what they can charge, and that's great, because it's like regulatory agencies, when people get mad, as they will, they will, Guess what happens? Guess what happens? You blame the company. You don't blame the uh, government that made it happen. Uh, we're seeing the same thing in credit cards. Uh, get after them. A lot of people are now going to have not be able to use the financial system, the people who need it most, throwing them out to the pawn shops and the loan sharks. But hey, we mean well. And why is it that in terms of big government, big government's always judged by its intentions, while the private sector is judged by results? That's the level playing field we need. Judge them by results and realize big government is simply a special interest. Now, I love it that the president talks about tax simplification. But in that same address, he talked about reinstating massive new taxes on what he calls the rich. That is, people who create capital, take risks, uh, make a little money. He's against them. And so when I hear tax simplification, I'm, I'm reminded of that old joke about what is the IRS version of a flat tax? Line one, what did you make? Line two, send it in. Uh, that's, that's, that's not what we have in mind. That's not what we have in mind. And so, and so in, and even on the foreign policy, you talk very eloquently about our people in uniform, the great things they're doing in Afghanistan, then rushes through and says, but in July we're going to start withdrawing troops. You don't think the Taliban didn't hear that, knowing that they can ultimately wait this man out? So, a lot of nice rhetoric, but the same old, same old in terms of substance. He talks about, for example, clean energy. Well, we're spending a lot on that, but in terms of a big thing on clean energy, how about nuclear power? Oh, he's in favor of that, but somehow, the, somehow they never get approval on the regulations. Like offshore drilling, oh, we're, we're, we allow that. Try getting the license approvals. You know, so they just drag these things out. And 80% clean green energy, as he calls it, by 2035, it's impossible. And the things that could do it, like, like nuclear energy, going to block it. Or how about natural gas, this thing they call fracturing, which have done properly, proper technology, massive increase in natural gas. We can now be the Saudi Arabia of natural gas in a generation, actually export natural gas to the rest of the world very cheap. Huge implications. But... I bet you they're going to block it just as they do offshore drilling. And what it means with that 80% goal, what that means is the government will tell utilities what they must do. That means more government control. You see it in regulations. You see it in the FCC putting their claws into the Internet over Christmas. Federal Trade Commission is doing the same thing. You see it in the Interior Department blocking you, making a, they say they can now take over a wild, what they call wild uh, lands, uh, wilderness lands, in a way that uh, was not intended by Congress to block uh, drilling. All of this stuff is going on. And FDA, and then we're going to get to the positive things this Congress is going to do. The FDA. You, you see it in antibiotics. They've made it impossible 
for getting new medications out. And the real dollars, take away the inflation, the cost of getting a drug to market today, 30 years ago is $138 million, today it's a billion dollars. In the mid-1980s, you could do a clinical trial with an average of 1,400 patients, and it's now 4,000, sometimes as much as 30,000. They change the rules in the middle of a clinical trial, and then they wonder why new antibiotics coming out of these killer bacteria are not coming along. Henry Waxman, you know him from this state, yeah, shows we believe in diversity in this country. You know, a guy like that's in Congress. But, but Henry Waxman says, this is a failure of free markets. No, Henry, it's a failure of government when government runs amok and more interested in creating regulation than creating safety and efficacy in terms of uh, antibiotics. You saw it in Aviston over Christmas. What did they do? Removed approval of it, even though Western Europe's doing it. They didn't say it wasn't working. They just said they didn't think it was cost effective. In effect, that was their real reason. They used some mumbo jumbo, but uh, they, the, it was the cost, $88,000, a lot of money. But if it cost 1000 would they have had that removed from market? No. Save money, lose lives. This is happening all the time. So what then should the Republicans do? Well, on the regulatory side, they should pass in the House and push it in the Senate. In terms of regulations, no more of this sloughing off of agencies and saying, oh, we those terrible bureaucrats. Now, any regulation that has an impact of more than $50 million, $100 million, must be expressly proved by the United States Congress. No more hiding and saying, oh, I'm not responsible for it. Go on the line in terms of these terrible regulations. And in terms of... <clears throat> This is where it gets exciting. In terms of health care, a lot of positive things can be done. Ask yourselves, why do we have a health care crisis? If you ask that question, suddenly things become very clear. When you ask, why do we have a health care crisis, the instant answer is, well, it's because we're using more health care. People are living longer. Well, I must admit, as I get older, I don't think longevity is a crisis. My heirs might, but I kind of like it. But, but, but Think of it, why is that a crisis? You know, in anything else in the world, if people want more of something, guess what? Entrepreneurs come up and give it to them, try to figure out ways to do it. People want more software. Silicon Valley is very happy. People want more apps. A lot of writers around the country are very happy to do it. People want more cars. Detroit would be very happy. People want more inspiration about a great president. Reagan Library here is doing it, meeting the demand. And so what is it? Yes. So what is it? What is it, what is it about health care that's different? What's about, different about health care is we don't have real free markets. It is a convoluted system. We have pockets of it, which is why we still produce more medical devices, more drugs and new drugs than the rest of the world put together, but it's not a real free market. So we don't get the kind of constant productivity we get everywhere else. Because we grew up with this system, we don't realize how crazy it is. Think of it, if you go to a doctor, clinic, or hospital, and you ask in advance, what it costs, they look at you. It means one of two things. It means either you're uninsured or you're a lunatic. Why would you want to know what it costs? Now imagine going to a restaurant, buy a fine bottle of wine and say, I don't care what it costs, that's Kaiser Permenti's problem, Blue Shield's problem, it's not, not my problem. So the system goes haywire. So the key thing is, and this is where this new Congress can do a, a, so much good, is make the case that we need real free markets in health care and real, uh, real free markets. And here's, you know, and, 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 and proper safety nets. You know, take food. Food is more basic than health care. No food, no health care, no nothing. So, and food, because people may have problems from time to time getting food, does that mean government takes over the farms? No. If they did, we'd have no more obesity. Michelle Obama would have to find something else a cause to do because we'd all be starving. You know, they tried it in, they tried it in China and Russia, governments running the farms. So in this country, we allow the farmers to grow the food, private companies process the food, trucks to deliver the food, restaurants, supermarkets, grocery stores to sell the food. If people have problems, we have everything from food stamps to food banks to deal with it. In health care, why not do the same thing, move in that direction? They're exciting proposals, and the new members know it. How about nationwide shopping for health insurance? You know, get real competition there. And, 
I live in New Jersey. We have crazy regulations there. I can buy a policy virtually identical to New Jersey at half the cost in Pennsylvania, even less than that in Wisconsin. I can buy a house in Pennsylvania. I can buy a car in Wisconsin. Can't buy the insurance. You know that crazy gecko you see on TV peddling uh, uh, auto insurance? Get them to start selling health insurance. And, you know, if you open up the market, you can get new companies along figuring out how to do it. And how about real tort reform so doctors can practice medicine again? Put you know, I'd love, I'd love to see this president uh, veto a tort reform, veto uh, nationwide shopping, or Harry Reid having to explain to members and uh, you know, candidates in Virginia and uh, Montana and elsewhere, oh, well, we didn't let it come to a vote. Well, why did you uh, let Harry Reid get away with that? Put these people's feet to the fire. Remember, 23 Democrats are coming up for re-election in 2012. Put the fight to feet to the fire on this kind of thing. On taxes, how about equal treatment? You know. If business gets a tax deduction, if you're an individual, unless you're self-employed, you pay with after-tax dollars. Put that on the president's desk and see if he'll veto that. Say, it's, oh, it's too expensive. Boy, that would be a new one. And how about removing barriers to health savings accounts, removing barriers to making it easier for people or businesses to combine together? And on Obamacare, a lot of specific things that can be done. How about uh, allow, allowing, uh, uh, getting rid of these, uh, these uh, ceilings they have? On deductibles, the federal government's telling you how, what the limit on deductions uh, in terms of a deductible. That should be the marketplace to decide that. And here's one thing that's very, very important where the Republicans some, sometimes make a big mistake. I'll be blunt about it. What do you do about people with pre-existing conditions? The answer of the Democrats is no barring people from, with pre-existing conditions from getting insurance. It sounds very nice what they call guaranteed access, I think they call it. Then they have community pricing, no difference in price between uh, if you're very uh, old or very young or just a, a slight variations. Sounds all very good, but there's a better way to provide the safety net. This is where we've got to do some real heavy lifting, and that is several states already do what the president wants to do nationwide with pre-existing conditions. And it's no coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, that in states like mine of New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts that do this, massive increases in the cost of health insurance, which just means more people go uninsured. Massive increases. Is there a better way to do it? Yes. High-risk pools, 35 states have them. Uh, we should strengthen those. So if somebody can't get the insurance, they know they can get it from that high-risk pool. And for people with uh, either low incomes or particularly distressed situations, have subsidies to do it. You know, we do it with food. Why can't we do it in health care? And that way you'll have competition, you'll have lower premiums, and you also have a much better safety net than what you find in New Jersey, New York, and these states that have this so-called guaranteed access and good, good intentions, but disastrous results in the marketplace. And this also gets to Medicaid reform. Why not give block grants to the states to decide what's best and have something like high-risk pools that really meet the needs of the low-income people that, uh, and, and have uh, vouchers and the like so we get a true marketplace but get coverage at the same time. This can be exciting things. So if you do some of these things, and to remove the basis of power in Obamacare. For example, they, want to, uh, they have this uh, uh, provision in there in terms of uh, how much premium a company must spend on medical benefits. And so the, call the loss ratio. Well, you may have read a few months ago, the McDonald's said, we're going to have to drop coverage for 30,000 people because of this crazy thing. McDonald's gets a waiver. That's politics. You get it if you play our game. But if we don't like you, you don't get it. No objective thing. That goes against what the founders had in mind. That is the road to tyranny where bureaucrats can make decisions. Who gets the waiver and who doesn't? Take that power away from them. And in terms of... And there are numerous other positive things you can do in attacking Obamacare. For example, the assault on Medicare Advantage, which means you don't have to get Medigap insurance. 22% of people have it now. 40% of African American uh, retirees are on, uh, use that advantage. 54% of Latino senior citizens have it, yet the administration is determined to destroy it. So there are a lot of positive things that can be done. And, and people understand they don't want the government running these things. And you can also can have good positive safety nets. So 
hit the, hit the thing on food. If we can do it in food, we can do it in health care. And have hearings on the FDA and what it's doing in terms of drug approval and put their feet to the fire of why lives are being lost. Why 20,000 people, over 20,000 people a year die from bacteria in hospitals because we don't have adequate antibiotics. That is a, that's a horrific scandal. Now on the tax side, on the tax side, this is a huge opportunity. If this man says the president that we are in favor of tax simplification, well, let's put him to the test and pass the flat tax. Let's go for broke on this thing. And you know, you know, you know the catechism on this, the litany on this. Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, 272 words in length, defined the character of the American nation. Declaration of Independence, 1,500 words. Constitution with the amendment, 7,200 words. Holy Bible, which took centuries to put together, 773,000 words. The Federal Income Tax Code, all its attendant rules and regulations, nine and a half million words and rising. And nobody knows what's in it. You don't have to go to the Amazon to find exotic creatures. It's crawling with it. As you know, 25 years ago, since 1986, the code has been amended 14,000 times. The IRS has told us we now spend seven and a half billion hours a year filling out tax forms, the equivalent of three million full-time jobs. And for what? And you know, several years ago, Money Magazine did a survey, took a hypothetical family's finances, gave them to 46 experts, tax preparers, asked them to prepare that family's tax return. You know what they got back? 46 different returns, 46 different estimates, thousands of dollars of difference. This is from people who make their living at the thing. There's only one thing to do with this beast, kill it, bury it, hope it never rises again to terrorize the American people. Start all over. Start all over. I'd replace it with a simple flat tax, 17% rate, do it on a single sheet of paper, generous exemptions for adults and for children, family of four, for example, no federal income tax on your first $46,000 of income, only 17% above that, no tax on your savings and no death taxes. You should be allowed to leave the world unmolested by the IRS. Or, as, as our founders would say, no taxation without respiration. <laughs> Pass that, let Harry Reid choke on the flat tax. Let the White House choke on the flat tax, and we will get it in 2012. And on the spending side, on the spending side, we should hammer home two basic things. One is whenever government spending since World War II or in the 1930s has gone up as a percentage of GM GDP, so does unemployment. More government spending, more unemployment. The history shows that. The larger the government, the lar smaller the private sector, hence the fewer the jobs. Is that may get to the mystery? Why is unemployment remaining so stubbornly high? And ask the question, where does the money come from? It does not come from Mars. It's not manna from heaven. It comes from the we the people, through either taxing, borrowing, or printing money, which is the same thing as a tax. In terms of cutting, oh, wonderful things. Travel. Fed spend $23 billion a year on travel. Cut that in half. Do you think anyone but them would miss it? Ethanol, $5 billion. Ag subsidy, $15 billion. Unspent stimulus money, anywhere from 12 to $20 billion. Earmarks, earmarks, you know, what's bad about it is not just the number, 15, 20 billion, whatever the number is. It's the corruption that it encourages, human nature being what it is, and also the grease that it is to pass these horrible bills like Obamacare and virtual takeover of the financial industry. So in terms, in terms of these kinds of issues, in terms of uh, spending, remember, where does it come from? And history shows the more the Fed spend, the less we have and the less prosperity and opportunity we have. And on education, on education, you know, Fed shouldn't run education. One thing they can do, since they're in charge of the District of Columbia, remember they passed a scholarship bill several years ago, 4,000 kids could escape the worst school system in the world. The president made sure that was kiboshed. Well, don't renew that program for 4,000. Renew it instead and let him say we can't afford it for every single kid in Washington, D.C. to have choice to go to the schools. And you know, can it work? Can it work in the real world? Well, just to have hearings on New Orleans. New Orleans, government took over most of the schools after Katrina. Most of them are charter schools today. If a 
parent doesn't like a school, he or she can send their kid to another school, regardless of neighborhood, even though 84% of the kids there are from low-income families, guess what? Test scores have zoomed because schools have the freedom to do what gets the kids the education they need. And now, in closing, the most boring subject in the world, but absolutely critical, the dollar, monetary policy, interest rates, the Federal Reserve. I can see the eyes getting heavy already. <laughs> now, just one travel tip, since you've been a very good audience so far. One travel tip on monetary policy. If you ever find yourself in an airplane, in coach, middle seat, on the runway, watching your life pass away, want a little bit, you, want, you want a little bit of elbow room with your seatmates? Start talking about monetary policy and you'll have all the room you want. <laughs> or, or if any of you are single or if kids are single, grandkids are single, on a bad date, want out, talk about monetary policy and you'll never see that person again. <laughs> but if you think of it, if you think of monetary policy and the priesthood of the Fed doesn't want you to know, just think of it as you would an automobile. You can have a magnificent vehicle, truck, whatever it is you drive. You can have a magnificent vehicle. But if you don't have sufficient fuel, stall the engine. Too much, you flood the engine. Right amount, you have a chance to move ahead. The Fed has been on a bender since the early part of the last decade, printing money, printing money. And you know what happens when you print money? You get a lower standard of living. You know, they're revising, as they do the economic numbers from the last decade. Because of the weak dollar, standards of living has stagnated in the United States of America, just as it did before Ronald Reagan became president in 1981. It happened in the 1970s. This is not a partisan thing. John Kennedy, dollar should be as good as gold. Ronald Reagan killed the terrible inflation of the 1970s. Bill Clinton had a strong dollar policy. Sadly, the previous president, President Bush, did not. This president manifestly does not, and we in the world pay a price for it. Weak dollar means a weak recovery. Money should be stable in value. Stable in value. Remember, money comes from people doing transactions. I don't want to bore you on this. I know John's getting antsy. He said, oh my God, is he going to get into monetary theory and all that kind of thing? But just, but just think of, you know, remember, 3,000 years ago before money came along, we had to barter. So 3,000 years ago, if I sold an ad in Forbes, what would I get paid in? I might get a herd of goats, uh, maybe some sheep or camels. Then I have to figure out how I barter these camels to get PCs for our writers. I mean, just as very, very cumbersome. Money makes it easy, makes it easy to create capital, just facilitates transactions between willing parties. And so when the Fed starts to muck around with that, it distorts everything. Money should be stable in value. You know, imagine if Washington and the Fed did to the hour what it does to the dollar, what your lives would be like. And we have 60 minutes in an hour. Imagine if that, you know, 60 minutes an hour one day, 48 the next, 96 the next, 22 the next, you'd soon have to have hedges, derivatives, futures, figure out how many hours you're working. Say you hired somebody, 15, 20 bucks an hour. What is it, a California hour? A Chinese hour? A Japanese hour? Egyptian hour? I mean, it just, just makes life complicated. Remember, weak dollar means weak recovery. And so a weak dollar undercuts our prosperity, it sends capital overseas. That's why we haven't had the kind of investment we should. Just for, and, and history shows this. When we've had a weak dollar, as we had from the late 60s to the early 80s, unemployment went up and growth went down. When it was reversed, the opposite took place. Unemployment went down, growth went up. If, if, if cheap money, printing money was the way to wealth, ladies and gentlemen, Zimbabwe and Argentina would own the world today. If cheap money was the way to wealth, we'd legalize counterfeiting, which in essence is what the Fed is doing today. It does not come from the organic natural productivity of the American people. So I'll make a prediction. I think, I hope the, the new Congress will hold hearings on this. Hold the Fed's feet to the fire. What are your metrics? You don't want Congress running the Fed, but you should have in a democracy, just as we do for intelligence agencies, find out what's going on, what are your metrics, what deals are you making, so we have some accountability. I'll make a prediction. Just as I think we're ultimately going to get the flat tax, I think in the next five years we're going to have something we haven't had since the early 1970s, and that is the dollar is going to be tied to gold. You cannot trust Washington with the dollar. Trust the markets to do it. Now, in closing, in closing, yes, we know this new exciting Republican Congress can't run the government. 
but it can do a lot and will do a lot in setting the foundations of getting our country back on track. And finally, people say, what about entitlements? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the balance sheet, assets, liabilities. And this is what happened in the early 1980s when it was hopeless, 21% interest rates. None of you are old enough to remember that era. That's called pandering. <laughs> I tried it in politics, didn't work, which is why I'm here today. But uh, in the Reagan Library, not my own library. But, um, <laughs> but, but in the early 1980s, 21% interest rates, higher unemployment than we have today, hopeless situation. Stock market in real terms down 60% in over 15 years. How did it come back? Because when growth policies were put in, from Ronald Reagan, strong foreign policy, and make no mistake, when the economy is weak, America is perceived as weak around the world, which is why the Chinese president can come here and not pay much attention to what our president is saying, because he believes, like many in America, is a nation in decline, just as they did in the 1970s, a terrible decade. 1930s were even worse when we were seen as being a nation in decline, nearly lost civilization. When America's strong, the world has more freedom, civilization thrives again. So this is not just about economics, it's about civilization itself. And so, when Ronald, Reagan, when Ronald Reagan put in his reforms, thanks to the members of the class of 1980, many took a hit to do the things that needed to be done to get our country back on track. But it worked. When people saw that America was growing again, what happened was he just didn't get more economic growth and more revenue for the government asset values went up. Because when people see a future, the present value of assets go up because people know there's a better future and there's going to be worth more tomorrow in that kind of environment. We can do it again. For all of the abuses we've heaped on this economy, do you realize that if you add up all what American households own, you know, your, 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 your cars, your goldfish, your stocks, bonds, bank CDs, the whole schmeal, subtract out all your liabilities, mortgages, personal debt, leases, credit cards, and the like, subtract it all out, we're still plus $55 trillion, more than the rest of the world put together, and gross assets of over $75 trillion. You know what that means is, you start to get some of these things right, the way Ronald Reagan did in the early 1980s, and by golly, it's not hard to see a 10 or $15 trillion increase on the asset side, which overcomes a lot of stupidity that this new Congress is going to try to fight in Washington. And on the liability side, Social Security, forget my generation, we botched the financing of it. And the key thing is politically, don't take away benefits from those who are on the system, about to go on the system, it's a non-starter. And forget about funding it from the trust fund, it's a fraud, there's nothing there except IOUs. It's going to have to come out of the general revenue but we have the wealth of the nation to meet those obligations. The key thing is younger people. Well, that's where the system goes kablooey. Why not propose and put on the president's desk personal accounts for younger people, where the bulk of those payroll taxes go to their accounts, with proper safeguards on diversification and the like? <laughs> turning, a liability, turning a liability into an asset. Turning a liability into an asset. And imagine what it does to younger people. They start working part-time summer job. They're accumulating a thing called capital. They're going to take a very dim view of those who are going to wreck what they are putting together. They own that money. They earned it. They own it. And if the government mucks around with it, you know what's going to happen. So it's good for America, good for self-responsibility with young people. And in terms, and so that's the way you deal with it in a positive way. And on health care, get more free enterprise. You know what that does? The reason why you have these huge unfunded liabilities in Medicaid and Medicare, $80 trillion, because it assumes very little productivity in medicine. You allow the equivalent of Steve Jobs and others to be entrepreneurs and providing more health care like we do everywhere else in this economy. People want something. Entrepreneurs will find a way to provide it and do it in ways we couldn't even imagine before. You do that, those liability numbers come crashing down because productivity is going up. That's the positive way to do it. We don't have to raise the retirement age to 93. We don't have to shoot everyone above, above the age of 75 to cure the Medicare problem. There are positive Reagan-esque ways to do it. So as we go from tonight, remember, as Ronald Reagan understood, times and circumstances change, but the principles of freedom, the principles of progress do not change, and that's where we take our inspiration 
the man whose centennial we'll be celebrating. Thank you. 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 Uh, Steve has been uh, kind enough to agree to answer some questions. We've got about 10 minutes for that. Before he does, I just wanted to, I was remiss. And when I introduced the class of 1980, uh, one of its members is, uh, continues to be a member of Congress today, and that's our own David Dreyer, who has a congressional district right next door. So, David, so thank you so much for coming. Uh, we have some staff in the aisleways with microphones, so the one rule I ask you to uh, comply with is if you have a question, if you could raise your hand, and they will uh, bring a microphone to you. I think we'll start right here. Apologies in advance, I do have a question on monetary policy. Um, <laughs> back in November, uh, when the Feds announced they were going to start monetizing the debt, purchasing debt, uh, we saw uh, interest rates increase about 100 basis points in a very quick period of time. And I believe the program ends in March. So my question is, how do you see uh, interest rates and the market going later on this year? And also, what's your opinion about raising the debt ceiling, too? Well, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the uh, interest rates, one of the reasons, and it's a peculiar one, that we have these low interest rates today other than the Fed manipulating the market, which it shouldn't, is fear in the rest of the world. Egypt, who knows what's going to happen now in the Middle East? That is going to drive people to hold treasuries just as a, uh, a way of hiding. And that's what you saw starting in 2008. So uh, who knows when you're going to get more normal interest rates, but eventually it has to happen, which means that's going to be a huge strain on the budget because the Fed is doing something very reckless, buying long-term debt with cheap, almost non-interest rate, short-term assets. And uh, in the private sector, you do that, you go broke, unless the Fed could bail you out. But who bails out the Fed? A conflict of interest. They have more normal interest rates and short-term uh, rates and allow savers to earn something on their savings. By golly, that means losses on their balance sheet and also means huge payments by the federal government. So uh, that's a scandal that that thing was allowed to happen this long. It's one thing to deal with a panic, quite another when you keep, keep, keep perpetuating something in the private sector would land you uh, with big stripes and not a fashionable stripes. So uh, I don't know when the rates will get normal, but eventually it has to happen. And uh, what things like Egypt or the panic and crash in 2008 to 2009, the Federal Reserve uh, manipulating the market. One reason why you don't see higher rates on the 30-year bond or the 10-year bond is the Fed buys them up. So in terms of the demand, global demand for these bonds, there's an artificial shortage created by the Fed. So uh, it's just totally skewed the market. So it's the fear factor that has kept this thing going. And in terms of inflation, one way Fed fights inflation is that once it prints the money, then pays banks at an above market rate to put the money back in uh, for, for reserves so the money doesn't go to work in the private sector. I mean, it just is bizarre. They want to pump the money out, but then they put these uh, relatively high rates and pull the money back. And regulators or bank examiners are doing the same thing. So it's a terrible thing, but that's all the reason why. The quicker we unwind this, the better. But the QE2 was a ship, some of you may remember, scrapped. QE2, this one's got to be scrapped. Now, the debt ceiling. Ah, yes, the debt ceiling. Um, voting to extend the debt ceiling is something people hate to have to do, especially when you see the monstrosities we have out there. So uh, there, there are various ways uh, I think maybe we can to tackle this. It's got to be thought through. And that is, don't say in advance you're going to automatically extend it. Make it very clear that there's going to come with a price. And if the other side takes you seriously, as they eventually did on taxes, and don't call them the Bush tax cuts, call them the Bush tax rates, because if they had been allowed to expire, we'd have had a massive tax increase. There's no cuts in them. It was preserving the status quo. 
The only reason the White House backed down on that was they knew popular opinion was on the other side for across the board. So if they think that the GOP is serious, that they do want these spending cuts, like cutting the travel budget in half, it doesn't have to be a big number initially, but $60 billion, $80 billion, $3.5 trillion, you, you can find that. So it comes with a price. And then, so you don't have to keep voting on this thing. Make it very, you, you, you can uh, have a gradation. If you don't have certain cuts by a certain date, the, the, the ceiling doesn't increase. You, you, you can tweak this thing, I think, in a way where you don't have members keep coming up and voting for small increases in the national debt, but also, though, get the thing with a price. So, and you also have some flexibility in that about right now 6% of the budget, I think, goes for uh, servicing the debt. We have plenty of cash on hand from even existing revenues, meager though they are, to make sure we don't have a default after the ceiling uh, extension expires. So there are various ways, I think, to pursue it. But the key thing is be credible. And this is where the Tea Party is so useful, since the media has demonized them. Say, ha ha, our new members, you know, the Tea Party is ready to lynch them, crucify them if they uh, go, go along with the business as usual. So, gosh, I really would like to uh, make a deal with you, White House, but I, I, I can't, just as they did on the, uh, using the continuing resolution. Only in Washington do they do these things. But in December, they never passed a budget in the last session of Congress. So uh, it expires, I think the continuing resolution expires next month. So in December, the White House thought they could shove through with the old Congress, uh, in effect, make it run through the year at these very high spending levels. And, and uh, the, White, the, White, the White House and the, and the new lead, and the new, uh, and the leaders in the House and the Senate said no. Why did they say no to something they normally might have gone along with, including 42 billion more of spending, including starting to fund Obamacare? It's because they knew that's going to invite a primary. That's going to invite a primary. So use that threat. My members can't go along with it. We've got to get something real in return. And with this in environment, with the White House not wanting something to go bad because they want to get reelected in 2012, they know you're serious. You can get real things done. So I think there are ways of skinning this cat in a way where substantive things can get done, which is what the voters want. Inside, I have a question also on monetary. I believe it was Milton Friedman who said that you can do monetary mischief. If you print a lot of money and then if the Fed buys back all the debt, you can do something comparable to this, putting the economy on steroids. That you're artificially creating things that otherwise wouldn't exist, maybe for 12 months, maybe a little longer. Then you have inflation, then you have recession. One, is this accurate? And two, do you think it's nefarious because it would just happen to occur, the economy would be good until after the 2012 elections, after which the economy crashes? Well, one of the things about inflation is the, what, what it does in terms of the illnesses it creates is not always uniform. Those of us who lived through the 70s remember skyrocketing prices. But the inflation we got in the last decade, when the dollar started to weaken, was a very, very different variety. It was almost like the 1930s variety when we last did that. And what happened in the last decade was you saw it go into assets, particularly housing. We never could have had a housing bubble if the Fed hadn't printed the money beforehand. The juice would not have been there for it. Yet what gets blamed for it? Wall Street and others. And uh, the Fed was the chief villain of it. So the, what, what, what the symptoms change when the inflation illness comes along. Uh, it's not always the same, but you know when that starts to happen, and all you have to do is look at the price of gold. For years, the average price was roughly $330, $350 an ounce. Now it's still over $1,300, moved up again today. Uh, that tells you all you need to know. So the, the, the disease may change, but you know bad things are going to happen when you cheapen the dollar. And standard of living stagnates. It stagnated in the 70s. It stagnated in the starting after 2004 in the last decade when the dollar really got weak. The Fed did not uh, do what it should have done. The European Central Bank sort of went along with it, even though it promised it wouldn't. So bad things happen. So uh, in terms of Friedman, he was describing, I think, the 70s, but he's right. You print too much money. It's like counterfeit. Just think of it like counterfeit money. You know, if you counterfeit in this economy a $100 bill, that's not going to have much impact. 
because of the economy is so large. But if you do 100 billion, that's going to start to have an impact. Phony money. And remember, you know, people in this, these days love uh, organic and natural. Well, natural money is people doing transactions with one another, people saving and investing. It's not something that's created by politicians. And we understand the organic nature of real money. It doesn't mean you need more gold. The price of gold will tell you. One of the things, and again, I'm, I know I'm boring you to tears, but in the 19th century, the Bank of England, which had the traditional gold standard, we don't need the traditional gold standard to do it today, but the amount of gold they held did not keep pace with the growth of the economy or the money supply. But people knew that because the Bank of England had firmly fixed the pound to gold, they, just, they were willing to hold pounds because they knew that the gold price wasn't going to be allowed to go up. So why don't we do the same thing today? I'm just picking a number now, 1,200 bucks an ounce. If it goes much above that, use a 90-day moving average so you don't get the skews of day-to-day. -day. goes much above 1,200, everyone knows the Fed's going to tighten. It goes much below 1,200, everyone knows the Fed's going to ease. You do that, you'll have money that people can trust again. That's the key. You don't need a pile of gold. The markets, again, will tell you in the price of gold whether you're doing it right or wrong. Uh, Mr. Forbes, I, I very much agree with your advocacy of the flat tax, but I am concerned that without a constitutional amendment to repeal the uh, graduated tax, we may wind up with both. What's well, the, the, the danger, you're right about the danger that if you put in a consumption tax, whether it's a VAT or a national sales tax, and you don't repeal the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which allows the feds to impose an income tax, you will end up with both. It will happen. It's happened in every country. Canada, they, have a, they call it a general services tax. Most states have both. A handful don't, which happen to do better than everyone else, like Texas. But uh, when you, you eventually will get both. And, and it, you know, take after 9-11. If a president going after a disaster like 9-11 said, we need a temporary income tax to finance this war, people would say, yes, we've got to do, uh, meet the emergency. And then, like so many things that are temporary, they stay permanent. Uh, like withholding of your income came as a temporary measure to finance World War II. So, yes, you're right, it would happen. And the thing on the flat tax is uh, I would have a supermajority. And again, give people a choice. When you bring in a new system like that and you're doing away with deductions, people say, what's going to happen to uh, my home, charities, and all that kind of thing? Give people a choice. Give people a choice. You can go with the new system, or if you wish, you can stay with the old. See which one is better. You do that, and you remove a lot of anxiety okay, let's try this new thing, because if it doesn't work, I already have an automatic way of going back to something that uh, may not be good, but it's better than what this thing is. So let people choose. 99% I think would go with the new, but that way you just lower the temperature, and politically then becomes very feasible. That's what's got to be part of what you throw on the president's desk on the flat tax, is that choice. So then people say, let's try it, because we know this abomination is not working. Well, thank, thank you very much. And thank you for your kindness. Thank you. Well done, Steve. Thank you so much. Uh, well, this concludes our program for this evening. Safe travels to you all, and thank you so much for coming.